we have talked uh, a number of times, and I think we see very much eye to eye about the shape of the future. Uh, this is a world uh, that is rich with data, data often produced not just by people typing on machines, but increasingly by sensors of all kinds. And one of the perspectives you have is that the government actually has some pretty unique capabilities for dealing with massive amounts of data. It's just not necessarily focused on the right problems. So you maybe give us your take on this hidden opportunity. Yeah, I think there's, a, there's an implicit perfect storm that could happen if the right forces are nudged in the right direction. Um, you know, if you look around at our clients that have big data, very large scale data stores, there are all the familiar examples like cl clickstream data and retail and things of that nature that are coming from sensors, coming from real time systems. The government has a lot of that. The government has a lot of uh, data about the economy, data about individuals, some of it sensitive, some of it not, but arguably our, our government customers have some of the largest data stores in the world. And we've really learned over the last five or 10 years how to apply very sophisticated computational techniques, not just to the numerical data, but to the unstructured data too, to automatically extract metadata to process things in real time, and even to instrument um, collaboration in interesting ways. We could talk more about that. So I think the government has some of the biggest big data and some of the biggest cross-cutting uh, issues to solve. And then you ask the question, where can it get the compute capacity to do this? And if you ask me, who has been the leader in high-performance computing? Who's been the leader in catalyzing all the work to build the largest systems to do climate modeling and weather modeling and material science analysis? It's really the government. In fact, in this country, it's the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. And they've done a wonderful job of encouraging the, the ecosystem to produce very large-scale computers that perennially are at the top of the top 500 list. And so I think you have in the government today a tremendous richness of untapped insight that's today sitting in raw data, whether it's structured data or live real-time data or data about folks collaborating. And you have the, the expertise within the government to assemble some of the largest scale computing footprints that, that we've ever seen anywhere in the world. Uh, the other hidden advantage I think the government has is if you go back to the discussion you were having with, uh, with Anish and Vivek before about the, you know, their roles as federal CIO and CTO, if they can break down some of the uh, restricted use of systems, which results in a lot of underutilization of basic IT infrastructure, and share that across, that should have the, the, the side effect of liberating an awful lot of compute capacity to be put to very, very high value generating tasks. So uh, you, when you talk about these systems at DOE or national laboratories, uh, you know, isn't that being used for existing research? I mean, is it really available to be doing more generalized crunching? Right, and I meant that not quite that literally because those systems were built uh, for specific problems. And in fact, the folks who are pursuing those problems are always in a mode where they wish they had just a little bit more computational capabilities because the scientist's creativity will always outstrip yep. any procurement budget. That's, that's the nature sure. of scientists, thank heaven. Um, I'm talking about the expertise that the DOE and, and the NSF especially, I think, have generated in how do you create systems like that? How do you not build those systems, but with very gentle pushes through certain procurements and certain programs, get the industry to build systems of a certain sort? And I think the real foundational knowledge is how to get the ecosystem of folks who build large computing to, to swizzle their development investments in a way that can have this great public benefit. So what are some of the large scale problems, you know, that you think we should be focusing on in the future? Well, there, there's a general class of problems for any physical infrastructure. You talked in your introductory remarks about data coming from sensors. So almost every physical system we look at today, whether it's vehicles going down the highway or uh, petroleum exploration or water distribution or power distribution, we now have sensors that go almost, well, essentially all the way to the edge of those networks. In fact, those sensors are very large in number, they're not always very intelligent, so they're quite an interesting challenge to communicate with and to maintain status of. And so we have the potential of a tremendous amount of insight about what's going on in real time and the ability to do pattern detection and pattern discovery 
and optimization. So you know, one simple example that would be familiar to all of us is the electric power grid. We talk about the smart grid that's been right. talked about a lot here. The biggest problem that a power producer has is bringing generating capacity on and offline. It's very hard to do incremental. You tend to bring whole plants up or whole plants down. And so demand prediction is really the key to efficient creation, matching the online generating capacity to the online demand moment by predictive moment. Predictive modeling. And, and being able to do predictive modeling. And so some of the pilots we've done where you express to a consumer through some kind of an interface in the home, whether it's a portable phone or their browser or whatever it would be, if you expose to the consumer a tool that lets them say, you know, Mr. Power Company or Ms. Power Company, if you would give me this much discount, I'd be willing to shift loads around, you know, which is a slight inconvenience for me, but for a certain differential in the power rate, I'll do that. And if enough of the consumers do that, it gives the power company a sense of what the futures market's going to look like for right. power. And they can actually manipulate those price differentials to smoothly vary from one generating state to another. And, and those can be 10 and 20 percent effects in the efficiency of the whole uh, power company's power generation system, which is an enormous effect. Right. Now, but again, these power companies are private companies, are uh, you suggesting the government get in the business of providing? Uh, you, you, know, you were asking for an example that's, yeah, uh, yeah. That, that expresses kind of the yeah. idea of where the analytics create the efficiency. Yeah, yeah. Right. The government would be more concerned about, you know, for example, um, you know, the military is very concerned about logistics and getting the right supplies yeah. to the troops at the right time and instrumenting the supply chain. And we tend to think of the big retailers when we think of RFID, but as you know, the DOD has been there every step of the way wanting to fully instrument right, right. the whole supply chain. You know, that would be an example that's almost purely governmental. Right. So are we, um, you know, again, when I think about uh, this sort of data future, real time, uh, is a big part of it. Yes. Uh, when I tend to think of government data crunching, it tends to be still have sort of overtones of batch. Yes. Uh, where are we with respect to real time uh, in government data processing? It varies a lot. Um, you go to a lot of places, and I don't think the government's so unique from private industry. You go to a lot of places, and almost all of the insight is backward looking. It's reporting, it's a monthly yeah. report on what happened. Right. Uh, and, and you've seen plenty of folks that speak about analytics talk about this progression from backward looking static reports to, uh, okay, I've got a problem, but it occurred a month ago. Let's do some deeper dive. Let's do a root cause analysis. Let's then do a bunch of what ifs. And so you want to move your time horizon for action from a month or a quarter in arrears to something you can anticipate in the future. And all of that depends on getting real-time data. And the problem with real-time data is it's very small grained data that you have to aggregate and consume at the rate that it comes in and then aggregate it in some way to do some sense making as the intelligence community likes to call it right. and detect trends. And it takes a fair amount of compute power and it takes yeah. a fair amount of deterministic compute power, which is not the easiest thing to come by. But, but the, the benefit that you get for making those kind of investments in the infrastructure is then you can take action in real time or even, even preempt things. Uh, I'll give you one interesting example. One of the federal agencies is very concerned. They have a critical infrastructure they run uh, that, that services a lot of public transportation and they were concerned about how robust is that against a cyber attack. And so they became very interested in, can I do low level instrumentation of data flows on my network at a much more fine grained level, more at the packet level than at kind of the application level and can I learn the patterns of different kinds of things that might happen to my network? If a botnet comes in and starts arranging itself to launch, it turns out there are very repeatable, very detectable patterns that you can see. And if you can consume the low-level gigabit network feeds with a real-time analytics system, you can actually train the system to look for either specific patterns or classes of patterns. So this is a form of kind of deterministic real-time analytics that prevents a bad thing, a bad outcome from ever coming right. to pass. Yeah, when you're talking about transportation, it seems to me there are a lot of applications in just effectively, quote, load balancing transportation, yes. congestion pricing and the like. Yes. Uh, could be dynamic. Uh, yes. The, uh, also, it, it seems to me that there's a huge uh, need uh, in the financial sector. Right now we have uh, you know, enormous amounts of compute power uh, used to uh, move money around yes. and a regulatory infrastructure that is uh, not at all at the same pace or using the same tools. You know? right. So when, when uh, 
you know, traders are, are uh, you know, arbitraging, uh, you know, microseconds, uh, you know, it doesn't do very well to look at a quarterly report. Yes. And, and again, it seems to me there's a huge opportunity to, to uh, think about what, is, what does regulation look like in the era of, say, electronic trading? Well, you, you bring up a very interesting point because, you know, the consequences of, of in the private sector, you as an owner or a stakeholder in enterprise that even unknowingly is part of some of this bad behavior can be very serious, very serious for the yeah. company's reputation and very seriously personal for the executives yeah. in charge. A and so most of those clients are not really interested in an end of quarter report on were we compliant with all the relevant federal regulations. They want some instrumentation real time in their network that says tick by tick by tick of the clock, am I in compliance? That's the kinds of That's questions. Right. Or, or, or let me know when I'm not. You know? <laughs> or when you think I'm not, yeah. yes. I don't want to suggest yeah. there's any ability to have perfect insight, right, but right. the fact is they, they really are seeking that yeah. you know, real time live indication of am I in compliance or am I not? That's right. And, and again, I just, it, real time just seems so important to me. There's a wonderful IBM ad that features Jeff Jonas uh, where he asks, uh, would you like to cross the street with information that's only <laughs> five, even five seconds old? Right. You know? Probably not a very good idea. And not a very good idea, you know? And, uh, you know, I, I do think that that is certainly one of the lessons uh, that I take away from the current state of the Internet is that, uh, you know, we need to be starting to instrument the world and having systems that can automatically respond yes. and give us alerts uh, when things uh, break our models. So predictive modeling, again, a key competency that I think needs to be brought into the thinking of uh, many government agencies. Yes. Well, one area that doesn't come up as often as it ought to in analytics is using analytical tools, using machines to amplify human intelligence. We've heard that story right. before. It goes back to Kasparov and the chess machine, right? We, right sure. we built a chess machine trained by about seven or eight grandmasters, none of whom could beat Kasparov, but their combined knowledge amplified by the machine could. Right. You, get, you fast forward that to today, and you ask the question, if folks are going to start collaborating in this Web 2.0 environment, how can I use computational capability to enhance the collaboration experience? And one of the things that we've done a number of times for ourselves, but also for some government and private stakeholders, is have something we call a jam session, where it's a, it's a particular time window, maybe 48 or 72 hours, where folks come online to discuss a specific topic or a fairly tightly focused set of topics. And we, we preload the system a little bit with a little bit of hierarchy of, of topics and some experts and domain knowledge folks ready to stand by. And then what we do is we let folks comment and, and post and do all the normal things you do in a collaborative environment. And then we take a pause, maybe 24 to 36 hours in, and we do very large scale text analytics on what are the persistent topics, what are the things that are popular, unpopular, where's the controversy, where is it not? And we harvest using these tools in a way that humans could do if the data were this big, but you yeah. need a machine to do when it's 400,000 folks from IBM or a large federal agency. Yeah. And then you have the second phase where the folks comment and, and rate and rank and, and, and interact. And, and what it gives you is, is the beginnings of a feeling of a real conversation with hundreds of thousands of people not exactly like it would be with us sitting around a table, but much more so than you ever could have done without that analytic boost to the collaboration. Well, that's a fascinating uh, uh, view of the future. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, I could talk to you all day, Dave. All right, thank you very much. Yeah.